the owners, and I don't remember the year, uh, but it was near the fifth year, I would think, because they then wanted to calm the game down even more, and they voted for a six-foul rule, which meant that when a team made a sixth foul, they had to designate a player to go into the penalty box for two-minute penalty, so called like a team penalty. And that changed the game dramatically because teams then didn't want to risk a foul, so they didn't press, they didn't high press, and no one wanted to take it a foul in the attacking end. So the teams wound up playing zone, and the scores, as a result of that transition, the scores went from 10-9 to 3-2 and 4-3, and I was even at one game in Pittsburgh 0-0 that had to go into overtime. Changed the game for the players, changed the game the referees and definitely for the spectators and i think it was a very bad mistake welcome to good seats still available a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports here's your host tim hanlon well, hey there, everybody. How are you? Tim Hanlon here and uh, Good Seats Still Available, the curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports is where you are at. Thank you for downloading us, streaming us, or whatever method you are using to get uh, said audio files into your earbuds. We thank you kindly for giving us a try, and uh, hopefully we will uh, stimulate those earbuds uh, and the ears that uh, hold them uh, for the next hour and change with our uh very special guest, uh, a, a soccer Hall of Famer, recently announced the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame, National Soccer Hall of Fame is the official title. Uh, his name is Dr. Joe Matchnick. And uh, if you're a fan of uh, the Fox Sports uh, broadcasts of professional soccer, especially on the world stage, you will uh, know Dr. Joe very well as the uh, uh, inimitable source uh, of uh, all things uh, officiating uh, when it comes to soccer. And um, most uh, probably know, and if you don't, uh, you'll uh, regale in some of uh, some of the stories that are part of uh, Joe's background uh, in a uh, decades long, I want to say six or even seven, well, about six decades long uh, renaissance uh, experience and life uh, in the world of soccer in this country. And uh, Dr. Joe has uh, uh, been there as a player, as a coach, as an administrator, uh, as a referee, as a, a uh, an overseer of all referees, uh, as a rules maker, you name it, uh, Dr. Joe Machnick has probably done it uh, in the sport of soccer uh, in the United States. And uh, and a couple of the stops uh, in his long and, and, and often illustrious and sometimes torturous career uh, are stops in the world of the indoor leagues of the 70s and, and early 1980s, the major indoor soccer league. Uh, and it's uh, one of its... Uh, successors, the American Indoor Soccer Association. Uh, and we even get into a, a bit of the early days of Major League Soccer uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, 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 just after the World Cup here in the United States. And uh, Joe's role in, in becoming uh, the uh, the rule overseer and the referee uh, uh, manager and wrangler uh, for that league until fairly recently. So uh, a rich Soccer history. We're going to delve into a couple of different uh, components of it with our very special guest, National Soccer Hall of Famer, Dr. Joe Machnick, uh, in a couple of seconds. Uh, again, uh, we are sponsored by our friends at Audible. Uh, I do want to remind you that uh, it is always in good taste uh, to go to audibletrial.com slash good seats and give it a free trial for yourself. Get a free audiobook download from Audible, will you? Uh, it's a good thing for you. Uh, you can cancel at any time. It's a good thing for us because we get a little uh, little scratch for that. Uh, and uh, what better way to support your favorite podcast, wink, wink, nod, nod, than by going to audibletrial.com slash good seats to get uh, one of over 180,000 titles to choose from. Uh, yours for free, one of those titles, not all, all 180,000 of them, of course. Uh, and uh, there's so many different uh, genres that you can uh, you can pick from. Um you know, sports history certainly does not have to be uh, the genre to choose from, uh, but pick one, give it a try. It is free to try. Uh, you can cancel uh, at any time, and uh, there's no, frankly, easier way to do it than audibletrial.com slash good seats. Uh, you know it, you love it, you can't live without it, you got to try it. And uh, we, of course, thank you for doing so. And we thank Audible, of course, for allowing us to continue to promote uh, their fine service. You know I love it, and uh, I think you will too. All right, so promotional blabber uh, now is uh, complete, 
and uh, we waste no more time uh, in our uh, conversation. Uh, let us begin that conversation, conversation Excuse me, with our friend, uh, Dr. Joe Matchnick, the National Soccer Hall of Fame inductee, he, and uh, some of his uh, interesting times in the old indoor soccer leagues and uh, also Major League Soccer uh, in the 90s. Here's our conversation coming up. So I, I guess maybe the first area to sort of talk about, uh, Joe, obviously you're, um, you're now Hall of Fame officially. Congratulations, career. Um, Thank you. Uh, it did not start with the uh, old MISL, Major Indoor Soccer League. Perhaps as a prelude to that fun and frivolity, uh, you can give us a little bit of a, uh, a synopsis of uh, how you began your very robust and, uh, and dedicated career in the sport of soccer here in this country. Oh. Well, I actually played a little bit. <laughs> um, I, I learned the game in high school uh, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Tech High School, Brooklyn, New York. And I sat down in a class next to a gentleman whose name was Andrew Sheparovich, and he was of Ukrainian descent. And we started talking about hockey because the Boston Bruins had what they were calling the Yuki line, Busek, Stasiak, and Horvath. And he said to me something to the effect, well, you know, you know, you know about hockey, but do you play soccer? I said, no. He said, would you like to try out? You could be our goalkeeper. And he took me up to the gym uh, on the eighth floor of that school. And I, because I knew a little bit about angle play and stuff, it actually came easy to me. And I got recruited then uh, after high school to Long Island University. And, um, uh, I was myself and Ray Klavecka. That might that name might mean something to you. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, we were the first two players recruited uh, with financial aid for soccer at LIU, and we and we helped turn that program around. They were 0 and 16 the previous two seasons. The first season we were five and five. Back then, I'm talking 1961. There was colleges played very limited schedules, not like today. So, so, and then I went and played junior soccer for the Ukrainians and then for the first team. And that's how I met Walter Chizowit. Um, and that name also should have meaning to you uh, because he went on to um, become the U.S. national team coach and director of coaching. And uh, while playing uh, for the Ukrainians, we became really good friends. And even though we were coaching at different, you know, respective universities, he later coached Philadelphia Texas. I was at New Haven. Um, and I eventually got my A coaching license in 73. And he asked me to go on a trip with him with the Olympic B team to Puerto Rico for two games, three games. And uh, I did. And the first two games were very uh, let's just say unfairly refereed, at least in our opinion. And he knew I was doing some refereeing in Connecticut um, in the amateur leagues. So he convinced the Puerto Rican Federation to allow me to referee the third game uh, of that tournament. And uh, and and then, uh, you know, he, he got a good sense that I was able to referee. And he also knew I knew hockey because, as I told you, right from the beginning, so when indoor soccer first started to come around and it was being played in hockey rigs and the MISL was first being formed they and the office was in Philadelphia where he was located, they Walter became a consultant for the first MISL and, and they asked him, um, you know, who, who should be our referee, referee in chief, and he recommended me. And that's how that got involved in the beginnings of indoor soccer. Well, so did you, so. Uh, legend has it that uh, uh, Ed Tepper and, and Earl Foreman back in I don't know maybe in the se- early seventies, maybe seventy four or so. I don't know if they were involved in or they happened to see uh, an indoor game. I guess it was a, an exhibition, and I guess this is prior, maybe the beginnings of the NASL sort of experimenting with it. Uh, I guess there was a, a, a Russian soccer team involved in all that. Yeah, actually, I know a little bit about that because uh, the, the game that really turned it around was a game in Philadelphia between the NASL's Philadelphia Adams and a, a, t- a Russian Army team. 
uh, that got played in the spectrum. And Ed Tepper, who was a Philadelphia real estate uh, uh, person, business person, was a, uh, saw the game. He also was part owner of the lacrosse team in Philadelphia. And he surmised that indoor soccer shouldn't be a series of exhibitions. The NASL was playing a kind of exhibition tournament in the winter uh, with, with a different, well, they didn't have a goal built into the, to the wall, so to speak. It was, it was kind of uh, haphazard. And so he, he, he thought that the indoor soccer could be a league of its own, but he knew that he couldn't get it done on his own but he was friends with Earl Foreman, who had a successful uh, management career in several sports. He was part owner of the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, he owned the Virginia Squires of the ABA and signed Dr. J, Julius Irving, and was instrumental with that red and white blue ball that they had. Um, he was involved in the early days of NASL because he was part owner of the Washington team. So, um, they became partners and they set out to uh, get franchises in a league they were going to call Major Indoor Soccer League. The office was going to be in Philadelphia. And um, they got six franchises in the first year to start the season. And I was the referee in chief. And uh, that meant that I had to train the referees. And I also wanted to referee myself. I refereed the first game. Cincinnati at New York, at which Pete Rose uh, kicked out the first ball. Oh, sure. Yeah, and uh, that was in Nassau Coliseum. And I refereed, I don't know, maybe 150, 200 of those games. Um, in the in the early part, that it was really, they were unbelievable. The second year, four or five more teams came in. Buffalo, Hartford, St. Louis, others. Some NASL teams actually came over and joined the league. It was the best soccer in the United States for a period of time, um, early 80s. The games were fantastic. Yeah, no doubt. So let's back up for a second. So you're, you're, you're basically doing all things soccer that one could actually do in this country, right? Which was, you know, let's be honest, a, a relatively fallow uh, uh, and dry soil, I guess, uh, for, for <laughs> you know, compared to where we are today as a, as a, as a sport, right? Um you know, how does even a conversation like that come about, right? So obviously you're, you're pals with Walt, obviously Walt, a, a major figure, uh, certainly at that time with the fledgling national teams, plural, of, of American soccer. Um, you know, how, how do you, you know, make that leap from, you know, being essentially a, a coach and, 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 and a referee and, and I suspect other sort of administrative aspects of soccer into jumping into becoming uh, not only sort of in charge of referees for this fledgling MISL, but I got to think you even have to question your sanity a little bit because is this really soccer, right? When you come down, when you think about it, come, you know, in the middle of the 1970s indoors. Well, I don't know that. I mean, some, some, some people called it soccer uh, because, you know, it wasn't really soccer. Um, we had, we had time penalties. We had timeouts. We had uh, penalty box. We had, you know, goals, 10, 12 goals a game. So, it was certainly not, um, and it was played mostly run and gun. There was, uh, you know, very little defensive strategy. The whole idea was that it was going to be a spectacle. Um, so uh, I don't know. I don't know what exactly you were asking me, but, you know, the fact that I coached a little bit, the fact that I refereed a little bit, I had some administrative uh, abilities because by 73 I had gotten, you know, PhD in recreation leadership. So, um, I don't know. I, it was a learn as you go kind of a deal. And one of the things I have to mention is that since the office was in Philadelphia, I was living in Connecticut in New Haven and Earl Foreman was living in Washington. But uh, when he would come up to the office, they would notify me that I would come down to the office. And we actually had an apartment that we shared together. And it was during this time, not during the day in the office, so to speak, but at night at dinner and and, and through the night, because he didn't sleep very much, uh, that I really learned the ins and outs of sport management and league administration um, and became, I don't know, he put his arm around me. I was, I was like a son to him. And um, 
and, and they shared with me most of the inner workings of the league. So it was kind of special for me. Well, I definitely want to get into some of those inner workings in a minute. But uh, before we go further, I do, I do want to get a sense of how the rules, based on, on your knowledge of it and how you came into it, how do the rules of the MISL come into being in the first place, right? It's one thing to be a referee for those rules, but... The play, the playing rules, you mean? Yeah, I mean, who made them up? I did. <laughs> so, that, Joe, Dr. A, Joe well, Matchnick, yeah. so wait a minute, we're breaking news here on this podcast. Dr. Joe Matchnick, newly inducted into the National Soccer Hall of Fame, is now claiming that he was the creator of the rules, the original rules for the major indoor soccer league. That's right. Uh, the NASL had a rule book for their... For their um, exhibition tournaments that they ran. And I took that rule book and modified it greatly. Um, and especially they had a rule uh, that said, if, if something happens in the game that's not mentioned in these rules, the outdoor rule, the outdoor rule applies. Um, and of course, as we, as we refereed in that first year, there was so much that happened that wasn't in the rule book. We were constantly rewriting it uh, and sending out bulletins to the teams and to the, uh, by fax and don't forget, there's no email back then. So, so, um, you know, we were kind of making it up as we went along Indiana Jones style. Do you, <laughs> do you remember, uh, some of the, uh, uh, first or major rules that you adopted or changed from the NASL's, uh, uh, early, uh, attempts at it? Geez, that, that, that's a, that's a really good question. A lot of them had to do with time penalties, uh, you know, because it, what happens if uh, uh, one player from each team goes into the box and one team scores a goal, does the player come out? All these things were hockey um, stuff that I had to put into the rules that were, that were non-existent previous to that. So, so um, um, I don't remember anything specific, but, but it's, it's quite some time ago, but it, there was, there, if you ask any of the original referees, they would tell you uh, <laughs> that we were making it up as we went along. How did you how did you train those folks? Not only the referees, but also the players and the coaches and and anybody else uh, in the beginnings of this fledgling league, right? Because in essence, you're going to have well, we'll, you have six teams that have to play a game that they have to kind of learn, right? Right. We uh, we started. We identified. I think 17 referees we brought into Cincinnati for a several day clinic. Um, among those was Billy Maxwell, who was in the NASL, Gino DiPolito, whose name you must recognize, Artie Wachta, um, Guy Fratour, um, uh, you know, some, some quite a few established referees. Also, we were trying to bring in some geographically located to where the teams were. Because in addition to the referees, you know, we needed to worry about travel, and and um, but we also had a, a, what we were calling the alternate official who was not on the field back then. It was one referee on the floor, one official in the at, at the midfield line off the floor, and two goal judges. Um, and so we, uh, we we went through. Cincinnati had a practice facility, so we refereed a couple of their scrimmages as practice. And then we went out and uh, I can't tell you that we met with the teams. I don't remember that we met with the teams to explain the rules, but we certainly distributed the books. And if things happened, I'm sure things happened to where the players questioned early on also, um, you know, you know, <laughs> what's going on here. And we explained it as we went. Where, where did you find most of the referees? Did they come from the NASL? Were they also from maybe from hockey or other, other places too, or, just curious no, as to they, where all, about. they all had to be U.S. soccer referees uh, because we were part of U.S. soccer. Um, so they all had to be U.S., you know, registered U.S. soccer referees. Some of them whose names I mentioned came from the NASL and some, you know, that I, a couple of that I knew from the Connecticut State League. Uh, and, and, um, and then every year we added more uh, as we added more teams. And, uh, and then what happened? And this is really interesting. I think it was year three or four when we had a championship weekend in Cincinnati. I'm sorry, in St. Louis. And uh, where um, it was like a final four weekend. And um, it was also the opening weekend of the NASL outdoor season. And 
we had made the assignments for our um, our final four weekend, and Bill Maxwell and Gino, who are also were you know on our list to be assigned to do those games, but the NASL also signed them to do games because there was rivalry by this time between the leagues. So we so the the NASL also signed them to do games in the outdoor league. So we had to. Um, you get a police escort for them to from the airport to get them to the stadium in time. Uh, and and it, it, it led to the formation the following season of the first full-time uh, group of referees for soccer in the United States when we hired six referees full-time that would only do indoor. Uh, and, and, uh, well, six plus me. And, and um, so that was uh, a, a, a big step for us because now we had referees who were thoroughly familiar with the rules and thoroughly familiar with the players. And we had players who knew the referees when they walked into the building, they weren't seeing different faces uh, every weekend uh, because we only had those six guys plus myself. And, and I had by that time uh, cut my schedule down uh, and, and uh, didn't referee as much rather, rather to manage the program. So that, that, in essence, was a, a full-time gig then for the first time, right, for these referees, correct, or at least in the I, realm of soccer? Absolutely. absolutely. Uh, it, was a, it was a decent salary. You were talking, um, um, I would say, 1982-83, and you were talking uh, $32,000, um, and that was a decent salary back then. So uh, when so you're mentioning some of the tensions with the NASL. I mean, uh, when did that really start to hit? Did that hit kind of immediately when the league got going, or was it kind of tolerated well, until these until actually, these overlaps started actually, to happen? Actually, when the league got going, th- there was a good good level of cooperation. The NASL um, saw an opportunity for their players to stay in shape. Uh, by playing in the MISL and also having the MISL pay their salaries. So in the first two or three years, the NASL and the MISL worked pretty closely together. Uh, But then teams started to, in the outdoor league, started to fold and there was contraction and and then there became competition for those players rather than cooperation. Well, it's also, I'm sure the NASL and Phil Woosnam in particular was not over time particularly uh, excited at the prospect of seeing the game that uh, arguably they created or at least brought to the mainstream, frankly, you know, kind of being, I guess, hijacked very successfully into its own uh, league and uh, and success and, 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 a, and a rocket ship of success in the early 80s. I'm sure there's a lot of jealousy. And then obviously we saw the NASL decide that they too were going to get back into it uh, once or twice. Mm -hmm. That's correct. I I believe that's correct. So did you, um, all right, so let's, let's get into some of the the day to day. So uh, this MISL, I mean, did you, did you think it was going to last more than a year? Did you think the idea had, had validity and, 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 and I got to think that some of the initial games and, as people were feeling it out, were a little, um, shall we say, uh, comical or uh, curious, uh, to say the least? Well, you know, I mean, obviously we were attracting some soccer fans, but um, the, you know, there were fans of other sports that were coming um, to, to watch the games as well because of, it was being advertised as, you know, quite a spectacle. And you're familiar with the, the, the steam and the, um, you know, the cheerleaders and uh, uh, halftime shows and all of the things that the MISL did in addition to playing the soccer. So it was, it was quite an entertaining package. So we attracted fans who were not only soccer fans, but fans of all sport. And it started to grow. The crowds, uh, uh, especially in certain cities, uh, the crowds, um, you know, were quite large, St. Louis in particular. Wichita did very well. Um, you know, uh, Buffalo was really good for a while. Um, so, so, um, I never had the, t- never during the time I was working there thought it was not going to last. I don't think, uh, that was the thought of any of the owners. Um, it just, um, you know, it just, um, we didn't think like that. We had, um, Michael Menchel uh, on a, a few episodes ago, uh, a, a longtime publicist and uh, an executive in and around the MISL and 
He regaled mm-hmm. us, and we also talked to Kyle Rowe Jr. for a little while about uh, some of his exploits in the, with the Memphis Americans and, and obviously doing the uh, MISL Game of the Week on the USA Network cable with uh, Al Troutwig. Um, right. I, I, I got to think that uh, uh, it was uh, a curious uh, thing to sort of uh, referee uh, these games where the players and the coaches were, I guess, certainly in the first season, uh, kind of feeling their way through. How how long did it take to kind of for folks to kind of get it, you know, and, and kind of specialize in this and, and sort of elevate this to more of an art and a, and a sport than a curiosity, you know, probably for the first couple of months. Well, in the first in the first couple of years, everybody was on a, you know, on a cooperation kick um, because everybody wanted to see it work. Um, so there was very little, um, at least that I know about. Maybe Michael, being a, you know inside of a club, uh, might might see it differently. But um, there, everybody seemed to cooperate, you know, with each other. It wasn't really. To, until the first coaches, I guess, got fired for not making the playoffs, that they began to feel pressure and therefore would, you know, uh, you know, be on the referees and, and uh, become difficult to manage or the players become difficult to manage. But we would say among the referees that if you could referee indoors in the MISL, then you could referee anywhere uh, because, it, because you were making uh, a decision for, uh, every three seconds. I mean, you are blowing the whistle, obviously, but something was going on every three seconds, and you put yourself so close to the players that player management was the key. And if you were able to manage the players in the indoor league, then then the outdoor league became you know much easier to officiate because you had so much time and so much space, and so um, the, the frequency of the decision making was uh, so less. So, uh, but as the as the league grew, the tensions grew uh, greater, and and the pressure to make the playoffs and then do well in the playoffs. Obviously, there were incidences that had to be dealt with by the disciplinary committee and other committees, whatever. Just like any other league. Well, look, if I remember correctly, I think the pressure also became much greater on the referees. If I if I remember correctly, I mean, both watching games and and. Look, you're also talking to somebody who was maybe the, you know, one of the small handful of season ticket holders for the uh, hapless New Jersey Rockets for their almost one season. Um, the the intensity of some of these games, especially these rivalries, right? Certainly the arrows and the steamers and the playoffs and all that. I, I got to think the referees, you know, uh, and I know it for a fact. I remember, uh, you know, it was a became a little bit of a, a tenuous and almost dangerous situation with the fans and the players. Uh, the, where the emotions and the the passion kind of spilled over, certainly even more than I remember seeing in the old NASL outdoors. Well, um, well, that's true. And I mean, the game, like I said, there was there was a decision to be made every three seconds, but we had but we had to adjust to that as well. And especially what you know in the playoffs, which like in, in any other sport, basketball, hockey, football, the intensity raises in the playoffs, and our playoffs got to be pretty. Um, pretty tough to a referee with just one referee on the floor and another referee off the floor who had a whistle. And, and in some games, that referee off the floor was blowing the whistle as many times as the referee on the floor. So then after one one uh, playoff season, um, with the pressure that we were feeling, uh, and myself as the head of the referee program, it was decided that we would take the referee off the floor and put him on the floor thereby making it a two referee system and then add another referee off the floor. So you were dealing now with three and that helped, that helped, um, that helped calm it down because you had another set of eyes and therefore the stuff that was happening off the ball was being dealt with better. Uh, but even still the owners, uh, and I don't remember the year, uh, but it was near the fifth year, I would think because, uh, that they they then wanted to calm the game down even more, and they voted uh, for a six foul rule, which meant that when a team made a sixth foul, they had to designate a player to go into the penalty box for two minute penalty, so called like a team penalty, and that changed the game dramatically, because teams then uh, didn't want to risk a foul, so they didn't press. They didn't high press 
and no one wanted to take it a foul in the attacking end. So we, so the teams wound up playing zone, and the scores as a result of the, that transition, the scores went from 10-9 to 3-2 and 4-3, and I was even at one game in Pittsburgh 0-0. They had to go into overtime. Changed the game for the players, changed the game for the referees, and definitely for the spectators. And I think um, it was a it was a, a very bad mistake. Interesting. That's very interesting. And and, and uh, arguably, people could look at sort of the arc of the MISL. Certainly, it had success in the latter part of the decade as well. But uh, yeah, you look at some of the the old video of those first four or five years. Uh, it was very run and gun, very intense. Some of it was novelty, no doubt. Uh, but it did seem to be a bit more free or flowing uh, and a little bit more, um, I don't want to say seat of the pants, but uh, a little bit more sort of manic and uh, maybe some of the excitement, I guess, that people weren't used to. Was there any discussion about maybe reverting back to uh, the pre six foul rule or was that pretty much in, in, in cement going forward after that? Well, one, one of the one of the uh, benefits of the game being played with the six foul rule was that injuries were down. So if injuries are down, player budgets are um, under control because you don't have to add new players who can't play anymore. Um, so the owners were happy on the one end uh, of it because there's always a financial concern back then. Um, but I don't recall any discussion of going back um, to the run and gun game. Uh, there was also a, a tactic developed. Um, if you can visualize, there were five players on the field and one goalkeeper, but most of the teams after the six foul rule, and some even before, developed what was called a box and one. So four players back in a box and one player who stayed up front, and that player would be like a Steve Jungle or a Freddy Gugurev, um, Kai Hoskovy or... Um, Cracky, you know, someone with an extreme goal scoring abilities. So the, the key was to, you know, win the ball in the back with your four and then make a long pass or even the goalkeeper make a long pass as, as long as it bounced in the middle third uh, to this player who either would be on some sort of a breakaway, semi breakaway, or had the ability to hold the ball until others would join in the attack. So, and, and that, that uh, changed the game a little bit also. Okay, friends, sorry for the interruption. Just wanted to quickly remind you that today's episode of Good Seat Still Available is brought to you by our friends at Audible, the premier provider of digital audiobooks with over 180,000 titles to choose from in just about every genre you could think of. Audible titles play on iPhone, Kindle, Android, and more than 500 devices and MP3 players for listening anytime, anywhere. And for a limited time, my audience can listen to a free download of any book that they choose, as well as get a 30-day free trial when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. That's audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And you can choose from over 180,000 titles, as we said, including uh, one that I'm listening to right now. It's called The Ten Gallon War by John Eisenberg. It's the story of the NFL's Cowboys, the AFL's Texans, and the feud for Dallas's pro football future. Um, another one on my list, which I have yet to download, but is on my queue, uh, that could be interesting to our audience here is called the National Forgotten League by Dan Daly, entertaining stories and observations from pro football's first 50 years. Those are just two of the many thousands of titles to choose from, and not just in sports history, but you name the genre that uh, you might want to listen to and Audible's got it. By the way, two, uh, two guests perhaps that we'll have on the show hopefully sometime soon. But again, go to audibletrial.com slash good seats for your free 30 day trial, as well as your free audiobook download to try it out for yourself. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash good seats. And now back to our conversation. How about any uh, personalities in the referee corps? The Gino Gipolito is certainly a name that uh, I remember. I remember, uh, Names like Felix Fuchsman, uh, I'm trying to remember a few others. Her, uh, I don't know if Herb Silva was one, but are there any uh, na any other any names or personalities that uh, stand out in your mind? Well, both Gino and Herb were among the full-time corps that were hired that year that we hired six. And and Gino was the most 
he had the most personality. And and when and w- when I see a player who played in the indoor league MISL way back then, and and we get into a conversation, one of the first questions they'll ask me is, "How's Gina?" Because the players loved Gina, and you know, and he was tough, and he and he understood the. Uh, but he understood the game and he understood how to manage people. Um, and, and, and he did most of our more difficult games and championship games. Uh, Herb, he, he took over. When I left the league to go coach the Arrows, um, then, then Herb, then Walt Chiswitz took over for a year to run the referee. But Walt's refereeing was never in Walt's uh, um, <laughs> bag of tricks. So, so then Herb Silver took over the program and stayed with the program um, well, well into the near the end of the league, I think. Very interesting. Um, let's talk about that. So <clears throat> you're in the league, you're, you're running the referees, you're, you're, the, the, there's a professionalization and, and, a, and, a, and a growth of the league. I mean, to the point where I think in some cities it was uh, even outdrawing an NBA, like I know in Kansas City was was outdrawing the NBA's uh, Kings at the time. Uh, the Steamers obviously uh, are doing phenomenally well on, at the gate and, and a number of others. Yeah, there, there were. We had a couple of very good uh, uh, entrepreneur managers, the the Laiwiki brothers. Uh, that, that name should probably mean something because one of them is still involved in soccer. But there, but there was Terry Laiwiki who was doing our TV. There was Tracy Laiwiki who was uh, doing Kansas City. There was uh, Tim Laiwiki, who was, uh, no, Terry Laiwiki, who was, I'm sorry, Tracy was, Tracy was in St. Louis. One of them was in Kansas City. And, and then, of course, Tim Laiwiki later came on to try to keep the arrows alive. But they were all involved in the league, and they were all, um, all had, you know, great ideas and, and uh, you know, for, for making for making the game a spectacle, but go back to your question, please. Well, no. So I, you know, it's interesting. We got the Lewickies. I mean, a, a, a fantasy of mine, uh, maybe someday we'll actually do this is I'd love to get the three of them together when in one room, obviously have gone on to great things in their own particular careers, yeah, yeah. But, ju- actually, but just to four. banter back and forth, four, four. four of them. Yeah, sure. I'd love to get, I'd love to get them into the, into one room and have a, have a, a, a conversation about those early days. Cause obviously a lot of what they've gone on to do, uh, was uh, was begun and and uh, and gestated in in the MISL. I guess my um, my question is well, uh, now that you brought him up, I mean, uh, I also got the sense, and our and our previous guest Michael Manchel uh, kind of touched on this. I got the sense, I get the sense that um, that the league uh, had a lot of um, how can I I wouldn't call it incestuous, but uh, a lot of sort of cross pollination maybe uh, around management and teams and. And how things were going, I, not to the point maybe where the league was propping up certain situations, but I, get, I did get the sense that it wasn't just management of individual teams these owners were sort of part of. They were also kind of, I don't know, co-conspiratorially uh, trying to keep <laughs> the league going. Is that a fair assessment from an outsider's perspective? I mean, the owners, you know, made an investment and they were, you know, had to protect their investment. And, and, when, and when the league... Um, began to fall on hard times. Obviously, uh, they tried to help each other. Um, and so, for example, um, uh, my, um, John Luciani owned the New York Arrows, but Bernie Roden owned the Baltimore Blast, but they were partners off the field in business. Uh, David Schoenstein owned, owned the Kansas City Comets, but was later took over the Arrows when John Luciani said, I, you know, I'm not making this work in Nassau Coliseum. We're, we're competing against the Islanders who have just won four Stanley Cups. Um, and, the, you know, the, the, uh, we're throwing good money after bad or whatever. And so David Schoenstead then owned two teams uh, for a while. And, and there were, uh, you know, I, I don't know that there were other in what you called incestuous, incestuous relationships, but Certainly, the you can't um, have a successful team in a successful market uh, unless you have people to play against. So, so yeah, the league was trying to prop up some of the teams that weren't doing as well. Well, I, I guess I, I was sort of laying that out because uh, I, I was maybe thinking that that was a little bit of a, a background to maybe how you became involved, uh, actually 
jumping sides, so to speak, to become an actual coach uh, of a team versus uh, running the uh, officiating for the entire league. Um, you want to maybe give us some sense of how you got to the arrows and, and behind the bench? Well, it's it's uh, it's kind of an interesting story, at least to me. I my contract expired at the at the beginning of a particular season, and I think year five. And uh, I was working throughout that season without a contract. I, obviously, I was getting paid. That was not an issue. But I felt it really important that the person who was in charge of the referees and also on the disciplinary committee have a contract to protect himself or herself, um, you know, from from any situation where that person had to deal with, which might fall um, you know, which might be fall like on hard times for a particular team or player. So, uh, so I, at the all-star break, I, uh, had a meeting, um, with the commissioner foreman and some of the owners and, and expressed the need, you know, that I needed a contract to continue. And I was told that they would love to have, I mean, almost in a quote, they'd love to have me continue to work, uh, but they couldn't give me a contract. Uh, and, and this was not, I didn't, I just, I couldn't do that. So, 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 uh, I was offered the position, uh, David Schoenstead was moving to the arrows. There was going to be a change there. Uh, the coach Don Popovich was going to San Jose. He was taking Steve Jungle with him. Some other players, um, they were going to try to make the arrows so-called team Long Island, uh, make it a more of a, an American team, and they saw me as a coach who could help make that happen. Um, and I tried my best, uh, but it, it, it didn't work out. At what point did you did you start the season? I, I'm guessing this was the this was the last no, season I, of, of the Arrows, I came, right? I came, I came in for the first game right after the All Star game. Um, uh, was that the All Star game that uh, was at Madison Square Garden? No, it was in it was in Kansas it was in uh, in Kansas City, I believe. Okay, um, but the season and, with the Arrows, this was 83-84, I'm guessing, their last season? No, next to last. I'm sorry, I, okay. I came because then, uh, so the, the next to last season, I finished that second half of the season, and then I started the first half of the following season. All right, for our, com- uh, for our completists out there, that's used to, uh, uh, Joe is referencing the uh, 82-83 season as the, uh, the second half of that, and the uh, first half of the... Uh, 83 84 season which wound up being the the last for the uh for the arrows right it was a very difficult time because uh we you know obviously we're working on a reduced budget uh david Schoenstead was uh selling off players um diego pesa went i believe to kansas city mark leverage went to kansas city freddie burger went to memphis um and and uh you know, I, the team the team was not going to make the playoffs, but I'm I'm not sure at that time that making the playoffs was what they really wanted to happen because that would have cost more money to play. So I, I was actually fought, you know, to keep those players, and um, and I lost the battle. Yeah, I th- I think it's important to recognize that uh, you know for those who who don't remember, I mean the Arrows were the closest thing to a dynasty that the MISL had in the early part of its life, and you know all yeah, those star players. Years. Yeah, I mean they won few on four they won four consecutive championships, and in essence, then you know there there's a retooling of the of the team where also these star players and 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 an importation, I guess, of of the American player, which is a noble and and long term. Uh, benefit, of course, but uh, you know when you, when a team has uh, been known for being sort of a, a a champion and a stalwart and a, and a force in the league, uh, you know when it, it changes ownership, uh, changes uh, team mechanics and the players and and the vibe around that team, it's uh it's no easy feat to inherit that change, right? That's correct. So, so you mentioned yeah. the All Star Game in Madison Square Garden. Of course, growing up in New York City, that uh, to referee that game was. Uh, um, I would say in my top 10 uh, thrills of all time, uh, regardless of whether it was indoor or outdoor or anything else, coaching assistant coach of the 90 World Cup team. But, but uh, so that, that was a major thrill. And one really funny thing happened there. Um, Earl Foreman brought with him a guest 
um, who he, you know, saw as a potential investor in the league. And during the, and, and uh, he, you know, he handed him the portfolio of everything, you know, about the league and the teams and all of that. Um, and during the game, that gentleman whose name is escaping me, but you can remember, you look it up and you'll get it. During the game, the guy began to draw on the thing, and he actually drew the goalposts and lines for what became arena football. So arena football, instead of that gentleman investing in indoor soccer, he started the arena football league and drew the field and everything during the all-star game played in Madison Square Garden. Yeah, I think you're referencing uh, Jim Foster, who uh, is there somebody somebody on our list uh, that uh, we absolutely want to have on our on the show going forward because uh, this is the irony of all of this, right? So you, you have a sport that uh, was itself a mongrel from – Outdoor soccer, hockey, a little bit of basketball, right, into its own sort of new sport with a new rule book and, and all of it. And from that, derivatively, another sport, right, which borrowed elements of an outdoor game and and indoor soccer itself uh, to create arena football, which is still around today. It's a little it's a limping. It's only five teams, but it's it has lasted for quite some time in, in most of its original state. And that's ironic. I, I Fair disclosure, I was at that game as well. Um, there was something magical about that game. I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that wound up being the only ever MISL game played in Madison Square Garden. Um, I wonder if uh, that... No, no, I'm sorry. I have to correct you. I, um, I, I stand was, corrected. Was, Go ahead. There were, there were three um, games that were Hartford Hellion home games, I think, uh, played there. One of them was against the Arrows. I, mean, I think there were three league games played there in that same season after the All-Star game. I did not know that. And I can't imagine they were nearly as well attended as that MISL All-Star no, game. Not, no, no, no. no. All I right, think, well, you know, I, hmm? I think Hartford was already really struggling and they, they thought they could do better um, in Madison Square Garden. They moved those games there. I know one of them was against against the Arrows. All right, well, we'll put that out to our fans. For anybody who was at the uh, the MISL um, All Star Game in uh, in New York City, that was on uh, let's see, February eleventh, nineteen eighty one. Uh, the mo- most valuable player of that game was Adrian Brooks. For those who really know, uh, a crowd of over thirteen thousand at that game. And if anybody was at the, those three games or so that Joe was mentioning that uh, Hartford played in Madison Square Garden afterwards, I'd love to uh, hear your thoughts, remembrances, and hell, if you have a photo or two, hell, Hellions get it. Uh, that that would be great too. Um, that's an interesting little factoid that uh, that escaped even me, which uh, uh, happens uh, on occasion. Uh, all right. Well, so let so th- as the MISL experience, uh, you know, was 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 winding down for you behind the bench as a coach uh, with the Arrows. Um, how did this uh, segue to uh, what I think is an interesting concept in and of itself, a challenger league to the MISL? in the uh what was then called the AISA. How did you how did you get involved in in that uh in that fledgling operation and why? Well, uh, you know, so I, I was let go from the Arrows and and uh I got a phone call at home from Louisville. Uh the Louisville Thunder, one of one of the owners, um called and said we need somebody to run the office uh for the rest of the season. Would you mind coming out? Um, and obviously I wanted to have obviously something to do and all of that. So, so I, um, I moved out to Louisville for a couple of months and I lived in his house and, uh, ran the office. Uh, and that was a pretty good team. Uh, Keith Toza was on that team. He was the coach, he was the player coach. Tommy Mulroy was on the team, Jim Gabara, uh, Mike Noonan, who's now coaching at Clemson. Um, uh, Zoran Sabic, who's uh, uh, assistant coach at Kansas City. So it's quite a good team. And between that, uh, there was, you know, good players uh, in the league. And it was, uh, it was Rock'em Sock'em also. Um, and so I, I ran the Louisville Thunder and then, and then was uh, asked the following season to be director of operations for the whole league. And, and uh, so then I did that. And then uh, I think the next year I was commissioner uh, for for one year, and then so, um, and then World Cup fever 
um, I was asked to be the assistant uh, coach for the World Cup team. So, so then I left that job um, to work with uh, not only Bob Gensler on the outdoor team, but uh, John Kowalski with the five-a-side team. Sure. So let's so let's back up for a second. So the AI, the AISA, the American Indoor Soccer Association, uh, according to my notes, uh, it kind of got going around. Um, I think it officially started in the spring of 1984, um, and uh, I guess it was announced obviously a little bit earlier. But am I correct in in remembering or understanding that um, the unique approach to the AISA versus being a challenger league to the MISL per se? was that it was designed to be uh, as exclusively an American player-based circuit as possible? Uh, I think that what was unique, first of all, was the, you know, they wanted to be playing in uh, smaller cities. Uh, every, every city had an arena uh, of different sizes with open dates. I mean, and in fact, this is one of the reasons MISL, the original MISL, thought they could make it because there was before a lot of concerts. I mean, concerts fill arenas now, but, but uh, arenas had a lot of empty dates. So they thought indoor soccer could fill those dates. And there were arenas in these small cities, Fort Wayne, Kalamazoo, uh, Louisville, Columbus. Um, some of these cities are now big cities, but they were small cities back then. So part of that was that, you know, here's, here's a, an event that can attract in these smaller arenas three, four, five thousand people a game, and and um, and you and you you'd have twenty dates to play, to fill, you know that you didn't have otherwise. Um, I don't remember uh, Tim that there was any exclusivity uh, that players had to be American. Um, I, I I just don't remember that. Uh, it, it may have been sort of maybe the original intent, but I, I can certainly see that, you know, the smaller cities, maybe even a, a, it was envisioned as a somewhat of a perhaps a farm system for the MISL. But um, but interestingly, as as time went on and perhaps during especially your uh, commissionership, uh, it, it kind of almost became a more of a direct competition and or ultimately the survivor or successor of the MISL over time when it even changed its name, right? Um, you know, I, I didn't stay that, I didn't stay that long. Um, it's still, um, you know, after I left to work with the national team, it AISA, I think it changed his name, um, eventually to NPSL or whatever, but, um, yeah, it's, it continued to go. And after MISL fall folded, but it didn't have with all due respect, the quality of play, um, because it was, it was low budget. It was a bus league. Um, and, and uh, didn't have the quality of play that the original MISL had. And, and so I'm not so sure that the game was, you know, even as, attra- as attractive, but, it, you know, it was, it, it, was, it was still a good entertainment package. But um, I don't know. I think we would, would have rather at that time been, become a farm system and get support from the MISL, uh, but the MISL was not in a position to, you know, to be having a farm system at that time. All right. Before we, then, we yeah, I got it. So, so before we move on from, from indoor soccer for good, um, I, I, I'm just really curious as to what was sort of, uh, what was the life of, of refereeing and or playing in the MISL? I, you, you say bus league for the AISA. I can, I can certainly understand and imagine that's very minor league. Uh, but the MISL was certainly not necessarily, you know, caviar and champagne either. Uh, and if I remember correctly, some of the schedules, you know, back to back games in different cities um, and, and the, the number of games w- which became a more uh, uh, numerous as the seasons went on. Um, I got to think that the, the game took a toll on players and referees alike travel as well as the play and the uh, just the grind of the road. That, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, we mentioned the full time referees, so uh the six full-time referees that we had, they, they were doing, you know, upwards of 200 games, uh, you know, in a, in a season, um, both on the floor and off the floor. And so, so uh, it was certainly stressful for them as well. Um, but, the, but, you know, they, 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 they travel by air, the referees for the most part, and, and they had a good per diem and a good salary, and it was better than anything else they had ever gotten. 
Um, uh, so it was, it was for them, as for some of the players, it was really big time. All right. Well, let's get to how you got back into the outdoor game, which obviously was, uh, how can I best put it, professionally kind of going sideways. Obviously, the demise of the NASL. You had the rise of indoor soccer. Uh, you mentioned some World Cup fever and, and the beginnings of, of sort of the four year cycle becoming, you know, something of a, you know, on the radar of, of United States uh, players and coaches. Uh, maybe you can give our audience a bit of a sense of how you sort of segued from largely an exclusive indoor kind of experience into back into the outdoor game. And then I guess on the doorstep of, of MLS eventually in 96. Well, interestingly enough in the AISA, um, when the Chicago team could not get a building to play in because it was a university owned and it was used for so many other events, uh, they would play some games in Rockford, Illinois. And the uh, director, the manager, of the Rockford, Illinois Metro Center was Doug Logan. And and Doug Logan, Doug Logan became the first commissioner of MLS. And he remembered me um, and the work that I did in the AISA, um, not only with the referees, but organization and elsewhere. And while he couldn't bring me into MLS in the first year of MLS, um, they had lots of officiating issues in that year and uh, it was time they thought that they needed someone to work in the MLS office who would work with U.S. soccer and then later the Canadian Soccer Association when we got some Canadian teams who could manage uh, the referee programs from an MLS point of view. In other words, be MLS's voice with the federations Um, and that's the job that I took for year two of uh of mls and then i I stayed from year two to i guess uh, 17 uh i was there 15 seasons do you remember the game in particular that kind of put it over the edge for you to come in and and help professionalize this refereeing situation in the league well it was um my interview i got a call on labor day from sunil uh, galati who was deputy commissioner this is in uh, september of 1996 for those uh, paying attention he, he called me from Mexico, actually, and said, we're interested in talking to you about, you know, managing a referee program, setting up a program for the league. Because that first year of MLS, over 200 of different officials of worked games. I mean, it was, it was very uh, haphazard, to the, say the least. So he said, we'd like you to come down and uh, be interviewed. And so the first person to interview was gonna, me was going to be Bill Sage, who was vice president of operations, and I would be in the operations department. Uh, the referee services would be in operations department. So we managed to do the interview around a game uh, in, in what was, I guess, Giant Stadium at the time. Um, so it happened to be a game in which ended uh, in a tie, and they went to the MLS shootout. Um, and then, as, as I remember it, uh, Peter Vermes was playing for Metro Stars, but finished the game, but was injured and couldn't participate in the shootout. And it became a whole uh, controversy because they were still requiring at that time a list of the shooting order to be given to the referee. The referee was Essie Bahamut. And this was no longer even a rule in outdoor uh, that you had to give a list of the predetermined order of shooting. That the, that the rule it was in outdoor as it is now, the 11 players who finish go to the center circle and the coach determines what the order is, but the referee doesn't have to be told and, and the order is not uh, mandated. Uh, you can change it as it goes as long as nobody takes a second shot before everybody has their first. So uh, it got very confusing. I think there was a protest involved and da da da. And then I'm walking out of the stadium with Bill Sage in the underground of the stadium and we walk past the um, the referee's locker room and Essie Bahamas happened to come out um, and he saw me and he worked for me, you know, in the AISA and I knew him from MISL. I, I, I was on the floor with him in his very first MISL game in Wichita and, and he kind of like said, uh, please help us. Um, and when Bill, Serge, uh, Bill Serge, Sage heard that, then I think that helped me get the job. So if you ask Essie Bahamas, he'll tell you he got me the job. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if you're a Metro Stars fan, uh, uh, obviously pri- uh, prelude to the uh, the current Red Bulls, that that, that game was, uh, I think, the first playoff game in their history, and they won that game over DC United six to five in a shootout. I think it went eleven rounds. Uh, and I'm sure it would have even gotten more hairy had it gone to a 12th round because you had basically 11 players or so would have been exhausted from uh, who had been remained. Now, I, I guess the last the th- question on that would be, um, you know, since you, you came in in year two, uh, what was the discussion around uh, the shootout and when was it put out of its misery? Um, you know, uh, probably not necessarily before, but because of that game, but but as a tiebreaker and, and the embrace, I guess, of, of, of a tie as a, an official result. Um, well, actually, uh, I, I liked the shootout in my first year, my first year of employment. Uh, I then brought in the so-called shootout clock, uh, which were really expensive items, over ten thousand dollars a piece. And we got every, you know, every team to have to have one because in the first year, the referee was keeping the five seconds on his stopwatch and nobody knew. Uh, the official time as to whether the the shot was taken prior to the five seconds expiring or whatever. So, so we we had the shootout for a couple more years, uh, but um, the fans didn't like it because it wasn't real soccer. They thought uh, the players uh, didn't like it, uh, especially the a lot of star players refused to take. You know, you go into this uh, shootout and some of the really good players didn't want to shoot in the first five. Uh, there was also injuries that took place because there were collisions between the goalkeeper and the and the shooter at times, and even with the clock, there was still controversy. And and then you know now that I was in charge of the referee program, I was seeing referees having a solid 90 minutes, and then for one of a better word, screwing up the shootout, and therefore the whole thing, you know, is, is thought as being bad. So eventually uh, we voted to become more like the rest of the world in soccer. And we got not only rid of the shootout, but we put the time of the game back in the referee's hands. Because in those first couple of years, the time was kept on a on the scoreboard like it's uh, in college with an official timer. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, <clears throat> anybody who was a fan of the old North American Soccer League, I mean, maybe has a bit of a hagiography, uh, a, you know, a, a fondness for uh, those old NASL 35 yard line shootouts that I, I know I certainly did, but obviously those came after sudden death overtime, right? Which is uh, still somewhat verboten in, in soccer, certainly in international circles. I, I don't know. I, you know, versus penalty kicks, uh, if there has to be a decision, uh, I, I at least like the idea personally, um, uh, my opinion really doesn't matter, but of the, you know, of the, of the, a bit of variable, uh, uh, you know, uh, component to it versus just sort of the methodical, you know, left or right. And, you know, uh, it, it feels a little bit more dramatic to me I, as somebody who has been part of overseeing refereeing. And obviously now in your uh, your role with Fox Sports and, and uh, uh, decidedly being sort of the uh, uh, the uh, the arbiter and the uh, the voice of God, I guess, when it comes to refereeing decisions and on, on soccer telecasts, uh what are your thoughts about the penalty shootout or the old NASL shootout or just or frankly, how games are ended both internationally and or in league play? Um, is there any perfect way or do you have any preferences from what you've seen over your your storied career? Well, first, one of the things that really, you know, should begin to make a difference. OK, they've now added a fourth substitute or the, you have permission as a league to add a fourth substitute in your overtime period. But I don't understand why it's not greater than that once overtime starts. Because you, you have a bench, um, you know, full of players who haven't played. And, and the true, true strength of a team could be measured by the quality of all of its players, not only the 11 that start. Now, you, you would still have your three substitutes in regular time. But once you go to overtime, let's let everybody play. Let's, you know, let's substitute five, six, whatever the coach wants, but open it up and have a real 30-minute game where the team with the stronger bench, which with, which is should be the stronger team, you know, may have a better chance of winning. And then there's not so much, uh, uh, you know, luck involved. So I don't, I don't see why they don't go that way. And that would be my recommendation for a more soccer uh, way to determine the outcome of a tied game. 
in regard to the in regard to the penalty kicks, I mean, there's been so much cheating uh, on the parts of the goalkeepers in penalty kicks that you wonder. Um, <laughs> You, you, you know, you, you, you've you seen so many games decided unfairly with the goalkeeper two, three yards off his line and the referee not uh, making making the uh, shot be taken uh, over because the save, you know, the, the, the save was illegal. And, and OK, so FIFA changed the rule and said now the goalkeeper must be cautioned, but they still have a word in the rule book called blatant. And the referee is to decide if there's blatant movement off the line forward. Um, so it le- leaves it up to the referee, and it re- really should be a black and white situation, which the referees need to have better control of if we're going to decide a game with penalties. What are your thoughts of uh, the uh, VAR, video assistant refereeing uh, system, that the MLS is, uh, uh, pl- I guess, basically trialing for for the for FIFA and the world uh, body? Um, what are your thoughts? Good, bad, and different? Well, we've had, you know, fortunately I've had some experience at Fox with VAR because it was used in the under 20 World Cup. It was used in the Club World Championship. And then it was used in the Confederations Cup. And, and the key to the successful VAR actually is good referees. Because, because if you have good referees, uh, then you don't need to go to VAR as often as, as, as um, one might think necessary. Um, if obviously they want to review every goal, but by reviewing every goal, what's going to happen is you're going to find that some goals are scored because a player is, you know, several millimeters offside and you're going to, and, and as happened in the Confederations cup when, when Chile had, uh, a, a really fantastic goal disallowed that nobody knew was offside until the VAR picked it up and it was like a, by a hair. And, and so we're going to see more goals taken away than will be created. Uh, and I don't know that that's good for the game. Um, and, you know, we just don't have enough experience with it yet uh, to see what the effect will be with penalties. Will there be more penalties given than not given uh, as a result of the VAR? I mean, will the VAR be saying, no, that wasn't a penalty, you know, give it as a, a simulation or give it as a goal kick or whatever. Um, and, and so that's, that's another part too. And the third part, whether it's a yellow or a red, I mean, there's no referee who has given a yellow, wants to look at a video tape because the VAR has brought him over and said, you need to take a look at this and, you know, he's going to change his mind and make it a red. That's, that's, that's kind of hard to swallow. Uh, it will happen. Uh, and it probably will happen and be correct in some instances, but we've already seen uh, yellow cards be given when reds uh, were clearly deserved, i.e. the same uh, team, Chile, with that elbow uh, to the face of Germany where the referee had, to the German player where the referee had all the time in the world to look at it and still showed a yellow when it was 100% red in everyone's book. Given your your lengthy experience and, and dedication, frankly, to the sport, do you do you see envision either in the U.S. or or on the world stage, uh, or maybe even uh, suggest uh, any uh, rule changes that uh, could be brought into into play? I mean, there there are some out there that you know there are, we, we've all experienced those dour zero zero ties. You know that is a defensive mentality. Our our friend Paul Gardner from a number of episodes back, you know, certainly is not a big fan of sort of the English style defense first kind of play. Um, you know, uh, are there any things that you, uh, in your wisdom, could even think of or suggest that could, I don't know, speed up the game or improve the game? Or, or are we kind of maybe at, at the level of perfection uh, right now on the, on, the, on, the, on the world stage? Well, I, I would certainly like to see uh, more uh, support for the referees controlling and, aw- and awarding uh, the amount of added time that needs to be awarded. Uh, we've seen so many cases of, you know, five, six, seven minutes of time wasted, um, not only through injury, but through goalkeepers holding the ball, uh, through, uh, you know, through other uh, situations sub- such as the substitute, uh, having known he's coming off the field, taking a full minute to walk to the touchline, 
So an easy rule change will be when a substitute is being made, substitution being made, then the substitute must leave the field by the closest line. And then the substitute can be brought on. It's not, I mean, there, that rule, he can, any substitute can leave over any line. That rule exists now. But they choose to come all the way to the touch line, you know, to get the applause, but also to waste time, especially when they're on the team with the lead by a single goal. So if the referee had the ability to add the real amount of wasted time, we would see added time of five, six, seven minutes, and that would do a lot uh, to change how the game is being played. Uh, nothing in scoring, nothing in number of substitutes, number of uh, approach to uh, breaking ties, none of that? You think that's uh, you know fair well, for we, now? We, we've already talked about substitutes. Uh, you know, I, I've, done, I've had a big, a big career in college soccer officiating where some teams are substituting three, four, five players at a time. That's not what soccer is about. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so, soccer is actually started without substitutions. Um, and the first game I ever saw on television, it was in 1962, was the FA Cup final between Leicester City and Tottenham Hotspur, and a guy was forced to play with a broken leg. They put him on the outside left uh, because there were no substitutes, and he, you know, he became a walking player. Um, but they, you know, three three seems a um, um, a good amount. And uh, the other one I would like here's now that you. You just made me think of something. This concussion thing. So if 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 a player gets an injury where he goes down and is showing signs of a head injury, I don't want to say concussion because that's a doctor's determination, but he's showing signs of a head injury and should be given all of the time and all of the concussion protocol, there should be allowed a substitution for him that does not count. In other words... If he comes back into the game, the player who substituted for him comes out. Um, and then and, and so that everyone is playing with 11. It's usually an accident, usually a head to head when when there is a, a head injury. So it's no it's no fault of either player. They're challenging for the ball with their head. And if a player needs to the six minutes or seven that a normal concussion protocol sometimes by a good doctor takes to take place, then that team shouldn't be forced to be playing with 10 while that happens because that that puts pressure on the doctor and the coach and the team to get that player in there too soon. So I think that would be an important rule change uh, to be thought about. I think that's a great idea. And uh, uh, I, I would imagine somebody like Taylor Twellman, who's been a big advocate for uh, concussion protocols and recognition of, of the issue in the sport of soccer, might be a very good backer um, for that. All right, well, let's get to one last uh one last question, and I promise this will be the last one, and uh, it's probably the most important question of the entire evening. Um, I think uh, our audience really wants to know, what were you doing, and uh, how did you find out uh, that you were uh, uh, chosen for the National Soccer Hall of Fame? Thank you. Um, I was in uh, San Jose uh, because Fox had the final of the Gold Cup, and um, I got a call early in the morning around 6.30, and I looked at my phone and I didn't recognize the number. And I hadn't yet uh, really woken up, so I didn't take the call. Um, I didn't answer it. And uh, about an hour later, oh, but but I did, it, there was a voice message. And when I did wake up, I saw the voice message, message and that I knew, I knew that I missed a call from Hank Steinbrescher. Uh, so about an hour after that, he called a second time. Obviously I answered, um, and I, you know, was obviously very surprised. I think I, this was my third year that I was nominated as a builder. Um, and I really didn't expect to be named or inducted. Um, but I was obviously thrilled with it. Um, and then it just so happened that it was the day before the game. So Fox was having a dinner for all of the staff and the producers that, you know, come in and said, you know, we had done a nice job with the Gold Cup and they wanted to treat us to dinner. So I announced it at that dinner uh, prior to having even told my family because I couldn't sit on it anymore. I was so excited. So I announced it at that dinner and, you know, everybody was really pleased and gave me a standing ovation and all of that. And, 
Um, and then, you know, I, then I told him, you can't say anything on the air tomorrow because of the game, because I haven't even told my family. So that's why when Fox did announce it on the All-Star game, the day before it became officially announced by U.S. Soccer, they got permission to do so from U.S. Soccer. That's why Rob Stone said, Barbara, I hope Joe has told you by now, because, because I had made that statement that I had yet told my family, but so he mentioned her on the air and said, I hope he's told you by now. We, we have a new member of the Fox family that's in the Hall of Fame. And I thought that was great. I thought what Rob did was uh, I thought it was that was great. And, and, and frankly, what, you know, uh, why not tell the uh, soccer community who obviously has known and, and been, a bit, been a big champion and has benefited from from all your endeavors. And um, and uh, there's you know, you are truly a renaissance man. I know it's been said otherwise uh, in the sport of soccer. And I know we've kind of dredged you into some of maybe uh, the more uh, dark pockets of that. But uh, the, the body of work is uh, substantial. Uh, it's rich, uh, and it's uh, obviously very well-deserved. So uh, congratulations on being the latest inductee, and uh, it's uh, uh, with all due and all merit for sure. Um, Thank you, and, uh, and I'm very happy to be nominated or being an inducted with Brianna Scurry, who, who was a fantastic goalkeeper, as you know, um, and is you know well-deserving. I'm really happy to be on the same uh, docket, so to speak, or in the same year as Brianna is being inducted. Uh, and, um, so a couple of, a couple of quickies on our way out here. Uh, obviously, uh, Dr. Joe can be, uh, seen and heard, uh, in a lot of, uh, Fox sports's coverage, uh, of professional soccer, both on the world stage and, uh, in MLS. Uh, and, uh, I think is kind of getting a, a, a cult sort of following, right? Uh, doc, I think, uh, you know, how many years you've been doing the Fox thing now? Uh, this is my third gold cup. So. So I guess six, six years if you start, yeah, with year one being one, but so about five and a half, six years. Well, and I, I think it's, it's a great, and frankly, it, it goes right on, right along with, uh, of, of what, um, what Fox has done with football. I think it's a great addition and it's, uh, uh frankly, I, I, I wish it was more universal elsewhere, but, uh, we'll take it where we can. Uh, but also one, uh, as, as we sort of depart, uh, I want to give you a little promotional opportunity. I mean, you've been among your zillions of other things in the, in the realm of soccer, uh, you're still actively involved, I believe, with uh, uh, a a well known and 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 uh, full of legacy uh, soccer uh, camp uh, endeavor. You want to <laughs> you want to talk about that and and uh, maybe give a little plug for it too? Yeah, well, okay, thank you. Um, you know, back back in the day when soccer was just beginning to happen, there were lots of soccer camps, and um, I, you mentioned in the beginning of the show. I mentioned my attachment to Walter Chiswick, my friend. And uh, I worked at his camp, All American Soccer Camp, at school, and I, you know, and I worked with the goalkeepers. And and um, and over those years, I I said that you know we're really not spending enough time with these keepers. They're really being used for the most part as shooting practice. Um, so that you know we need to do a camp just for goalkeepers. So in 1977, I started the first um, number one goalkeepers camp. And we had uh, 39 campers from 13 states come to the uh, Taft School in Watertown, Connecticut. And I guess we did such a good job in that first year that the following year, year two, we had um, over 200 uh, goalkeepers from 39 states. And then uh, by year three, we began to expand. We went to Chicago and to Dallas and to L.A. and and. Uh, at one time, I think we were doing 3,200 kids um, in, in a summer or so, and we've had such good luck with the goalkeepers. I mean, um, Matt Reese is the current U.S. national team goalkeeper coach, was a camper. Nick Ramondo, Joe Cannon, Dave Vanoli, who, uh, the late Dave Vanoli, who was national team goalkeeper for quite some time, um, and, and others. Uh, John Bush uh, was a camper for five years. So, um, you know, thank you for the opportunity to talk about that. Uh, it's still an ongoing phenomenon, and, and this was our 41st summer. We added strikers uh, kind of 12 years ago, and we do a lot more tactically now than we did in the early years, which was mostly technique, uh, because the kids have technique, and they have good goalkeeper coaches at their clubs, and, 
And uh, what they need now is uh, how to apply that technique into tactical situations of when, why, and where um, to become the next Manuel Neuer's of the world. And the website is? <laughs> www.soccercamps.com. There you are. And uh, we'll, we'll promote that a little bit further in, the, in our outros and all that. Uh, Dr. Thank Joe Machnick, thank you tremendously. Wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for allowing us to uh, bring you and drag you, maybe kicking and screaming into your indoor soccer and, and M early MLS uh, days. Congratulations again on your Hall of Fame induction. Hopefully it will be uh, televised and uh, there will be a location for it, probably to be named, but uh, we look forward to seeing that. And um, we look forward to watching you on, on Fox Sports as well and continued best in your uh, still fledgling uh, soccer career here in the United States. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate this. Thank you so much. All right. Our thanks to uh, Dr. Joe Matchnick, the uh, latest inductee, along with Brianna Scurry, uh, into the National Soccer Hall of Fame. Uh, we're not quite sure uh, when and where the official ceremony is going to be. I think some of that is tied up in uh, the actual construction uh, of the uh, National Soccer Hall of Fame, which has been in the process of being relocated from uh, its roots in Anianta, New York, to uh, Frisco, Texas, uh, and it's going to be attached to uh, the uh, MLS uh, stadium there. Uh, I'm not sure when that all goes down. I don't know if that's where the ceremony is going to be, but uh, keep an eye out for it. Uh, Dr. Joe Machnick obviously is also um, a fixture on the Fox Sports coverage of uh, professional soccer. Uh, you will see him uh, there and I think you'll see a bit more of him, uh, uh, especially when uh, as MLS uh, gets more uh, uh, ingrained with the uh, video-assisted uh, refereeing system, which uh, MLS is uh, basically trying out for, on behalf of uh, FIFA and the World Soccer uh, community. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Joe will uh, have some uh, uh, insights and input and activity uh, on those broadcasts, uh, as well as the uh, the lead up uh, to. World Cup uh, next year in, in Russia, and we look forward to uh, many of his insights there, too. I think he, he adds a great deal of, uh, of, of information and, uh, and uh, sanity, frankly, to a lot of the broadcasts, about, uh, especially about controversial decisions and such. A um, uh, couple of reminders here. So Dr. Joe, besides his induction into the Hall of Fame, uh, is, as we uh, mentioned near the end of the, uh, uh, of the interview, is uh, entering in his, uh, I don't know, zillionth year of uh, running and, and being part of his uh, number one soccer camps. The uh, website address to find out more about those uh, is uh, numberonesoccercamps.com. That's uh, actually N O, the number one soccer camps, all one word, no, uh, numberonesoccercamps.com. Uh, and you can find out more about it there uh, as well. Um, so, again, thank you to Joe. We appreciate it and uh, we look forward to uh, keeping in touch and uh, we appreciate those stories and, and, and the like. We also appreciate uh, our friends at Podfly Productions down in uh, Gadsden, Alabama, uh, our uh, professional production team uh, of Eric Begay, Jerry Payne, Corey Coates, David Gregerson. Uh, and if you uh, need podcast uh, production expertise, I highly recommend them. Please tell them I sent you. Uh, and the place to go for that is podfly.net. That's podfly.net, P-O-D as in David, F-L-Y, podfly.net. We thank them tremendously as always. Okay. And we also thank you tremendously for listening. Uh, we thank you so much for uh, finding us on social media. Uh, please rate and review us uh, uh, as well on iTunes, wherever you rate and review stuff. Uh, Twitter, that's at Good Seat Still. Uh, you'll find us Facebook page uh, devoted to the show. Uh, Instagram, Good Seat Still available. Yada, yada, yada. Thank you very much. Take care. We'll talk to you next week here on the big show, Good Seat Still available. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye-bye.